There we go. So now we're on the record. Really quickly, before we get into some of the material here, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Ryan Hobson. I'm an instructor with Manhattan Prep. I have been teaching for well over a decade now. I've taught everything from GRE prep to SAT prep to LSAT prep. I've taught science to kindergartners and ESL to adults. I think that science for kindergartners gig was probably one of my best teaching jobs ever, at least as far as it being fun. I love teaching teaching uh, how to, uh, strategies to help meet standardized tests. I'm not a big fan of standardized testing in general, and so I like helping people kind of get over this hurdle. Uh, when I'm not teaching here, I'm a huge data nerd. I work at a company called LexisNexis doing data analysis for them. I also uh, have worked at the University of Pennsylvania in a neuroimaging lab. So anybody who wants to know more, feel free to look up my research on PubMed there. Just know that I'm the one publishing on neuroscience and not they are Hobson publishing on prairie dog habitat. I'm sure, it's great research. It's just not me. So I know there's a whole. Oh, by the way, we also have Erwin with us here tonight. Erwin is from Technical Services. Just in case you guys have any trouble with your connections, Erwin's here to help us out. Seems like so far we don't have a lot of lag and everybody seems to be connecting okay. But if you do have any trouble, feel free to double click on Erwin's name uh, and, and drop Erwin a message so he can help you out. So tell me something. Before we go on, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you guys. In the chat, please tell me two things. Tell me where in the world you are, and tell me what kind of a program you're applying for. And when you have that typed in, just go ahead and hit send. Send it on over here. Oh, Baltimore, I was just down there this weekend, checking out the kinetic sculpture race. I got some folks from all over the place. Philippines, Teresa, I think you win for furthest away. Thank you for joining us here tonight from all the way over in the Philippines. Glad to be working with you. Glad to be working with all of you. Oh, India there I see as well. Oh, fantastic. Oh, by the way, uh, Katie Prep, very uh, appropriate name there. What's an EMBA? What's that E stand for? All right, nice, very fancy. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, good to see you all. Just so that you're aware, the problems that we will be working with tonight all come from the Manhattan Prep Five Pound Book of GRE Practice Problems. Have any of you worked with this book yet? I know some of you have been in these uh, sessions before. Nice. I love to see some enthusiasm for this. I do think this is one of our better materials. I know that this is a book, uh, it's the only one of our books to crack the Amazon top 100 bestseller lists. Uh, not just textbooks, but just 100 top books. Um, not of all time, obviously, but at one point it did crack that list. Uh, great resource. It's literally a five pound tome full of GRE problems. And it's not intended necessarily to help teach content so much as to be a resource for practicing strategies, which is what we're going to do here tonight. Have any of you hit that point in your studying where you feel like you know the math, you know the vocab, and you're still not hitting the score that you want to hit? If you have, if you feel like that describes you, give me a quick plus one in the chat there. Not many. Okay, fair enough. Does that mean the rest of you feel like you're still working on content? If you feel like you're really still focusing on content at this point, give me a quick plus one in the chat there now. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. Um, I would recommend then, for those of you still working on content, uh, the five pound book is fantastic. We also have some books that are designed to help with content specifically. There are books that break down individual math topics like geometry and algebra. There are books that do reading comprehension and um, um, uh, text completion, et cetera, et cetera. What you're going to find as you go through and learn that content and as you start to get better and better at that is that you will eventually 
hit a plateau. There's generally a score plateau that my students hit that comes from, hey, I know the math and I've gotten really good at that, but I can't get to that next level. And the key to getting to that next level is going to be having a lot of strategies to fall back on when the math gets tough. And so that's what I want to talk about here tonight. I want to talk about some of the strategies that you can fall back on, and one in particular. So what we're going to cover tonight here is I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we do when things get tough. I want to talk about those variables in the choices problems in particular. We'll see what those look like in a minute. And then we'll do some problems together and kind of wrap things up. So tell me, right now, what is your plan when you hit a roadblock? Hold on a second. I see a couple people typing. Not very many yet, but a couple. Don't hit send yet. Even if you're typing something in, don't hit send yet. I want to put a minute on the board here, just a minute on the timer. I don't want to give everybody a chance to think about that and to start typing something in. But again, don't hit send yet. What do you do on test day when you're taking that test and hopefully things have been going really well and suddenly out of nowhere you hit this problem and you just have no idea how to tackle it? Right, go ahead, hit send. Let's see what you got. <laughs> I like that some of you guys are being very brutally honest with this, and not everybody's plan is exactly a plan. I saw fray, I saw panic, I saw anxiety kicking in. Very, very honest, and I guarantee you, if you're one of the folks that said that, um, first of all, thank you for your honesty. And second of all, you are not the only person for whom that is really the plan. Um, I'm going to write those down as kind of our worst case scenario. Very good. Very good. Now, I'm seeing some that I do really like here, too. Um, guess and move on is a big one. and mark and come back. Fantastic. Both of those are great ideas, especially in the scenario that I was describing, which was kind of the worst case where it's, hey, I've got no idea what to do here. And I like these strategies for that. One thing you guys should know, and maybe you do already, maybe you don't, the GRE does not have a penalty for getting something wrong. So if you ever hit a problem that you feel like you can't solve it, always make sure that you make a guess before you move on. Even if you think you're going to come back to that problem, make a guess before you move on. And by the way, I like what some of you said about making an educated guess in particular or using that process of elimination. It doesn't always have to be a random toss-up. Sometimes, even if you're not sure how to finish a problem, you still know enough that you can eliminate a few answers. What about kind of a middle ground here? What do you do when you hit a problem and you think you know how to do the math, but you can't quite solve it? Now what's your strategy? I see a few people typing, which is fantastic. Good. I'm glad to hear that some of you have already thought about this enough to have a plan. Go ahead, send it over when you think you got something for me. Ooh, try out some answer choices. I love that. That's something that we refer to in our full classes as a strategy called back solving. Good. Hey, 
there's still that eliminating guess. Sometimes that's the best you can do. Absolutely. I like it. I like it. So I like what you guys are saying there, and I especially like what Max was saying with that idea of back solving. That's a great way of solving some of these problems. It's a great way of working with a problem where maybe the math isn't so hard, but the logic of the problem is giving you trouble. A lot of what we do when it comes to strategies and as far as what we do when things are tough and we can't quite solve it, is going to involve trying to make things more concrete. It's going to involve trying to make the logic of these problems simpler because it's usually not the math, but the logic that gets you. Give me a quick plus one if you guys have had that experience where you did a practice problem and then you look at the answer and you go, oh, I can do that math. I just didn't understand the problem. Yeah, just about everybody. I mean, I'll give it a big plus one, plus one, plus one. Uh, for me as well. Absolutely, that happens to all of us. Okay, so let's try a couple problems here. I want to throw a couple at you guys to see if uh, how well you can do it. Some problems that might be a little bit tough. I am going to give you two minutes to work on each of them, and I do not want you to send me any answers. What I do want you to do is write them down for now. Just keep track of your answers on your paper, and I'll ask you about them at the end. We're going to talk about all of these at the end. All right, so I'm going to give you two minutes for each of them. Here we go. All right, so here's what I want to do before we move on to the next problem. I have changed our polling system so that now you guys can poll in your answers. What I'd like you to do, I'm going to show you, I'm going to paste it up on the screen here. There we go. You should see a little box with a letter, right? It should just say the letter A. And if you click on that, you'll be able to select your answer. Don't select your actual answer yet. Just go ahead and everybody select the letter A for me. Let me just make sure that everyone can uh, actually access that. Not in the chat. I see somebody starting to type it in. Laura, it should be right up above where everybody's names are, where you see the list of names of everybody in the class and then myself and Erwin. Awesome. Perfect. Go ahead and just pull in the letter A then. Just click on that and pull in A. All right, fantastic. I'm seeing that from just about everybody. If you're having any trouble with it, feel free to double click on my name let me know it. Um, someone, I think, is trying to draw on the screen. Don't do that. Uh, like I said, click and pull in your answer. Okay, good. So I'm going to clear those out now. Go ahead and pull in your answers for me. Actually, I asked you to pull in A originally. Now go ahead and pull in your answer choices. And if you're not sure, give me your best guess. All right, good. Good, good, good. I'm going to go ahead and clear this one out then, and I'm going to give you only a minute for this next one. I'm going to give you one minute. When you think you have the answer to this one, please go ahead and pull it in. If you're not sure, go ahead and give me your best guess. I'm seeing a lot of blanks still. Even if you're not sure, even if you're not quite finished, give me your best guess on this one. Okay, very good. 
one more. I'll give you the full two minutes to get on this one. Go ahead and take a crack at it. And again, when you think you have the answer, please go ahead and pull it in. All right, same drill. Even if you're not sure, even if it's just a guess, pull in an answer for me. Let's see the best guess you can make on this one. All right, good. So, give me your opinions really quickly. Scale of zero to 10. How sure are you that you got this one right? Zero is I have no idea what I was doing here. Ten is I know I nailed it. Oh, I love that confidence. Well, I'll tell you, I did see a lot of right answers on this one, so you may very well have. Nicely done. Strong work on this one, guys. How about this one? Now, I know I didn't give you as much time here, but what do you think? Zero to ten. Yeah, this was tougher, especially because of that time crunch. Tell me, though, tell me, though, how hard was the math itself? On a scale of 0 to 10, was the math itself hard? 10 being the hardest, 0 being the easiest. Yeah, it's just a lot of... Uh, uh, multiplication, a lot of foiling everything out and adding everything up. So what made it hard then? The timing, yes, max, number one, absolutely. Just like on the real test, I made it more difficult by giving you guys such little time. What else though? Even if you'd had um, three full minutes to work on this one, what would have still made this one difficult? Mm -hmm. That could happen, absolutely. Ah, oh, those signs. That's what I was thinking of. Those signs, those signs, those signs. And not just those signs, but that little tiny arithmetic, too. You ever had it happen where you have one of those problems and you get all of the, the logic correct and then you finish it and you go to check your answer and, or look up, pick the answer, the letter that matches your answer, and none of them match? And it turns out it was some silly arithmetic mistake. Plus one if that's happened to you. Yeah, of course. Especially when you have long, complicated algebra like this. Absolutely. And then this last one here. And this one's one of my favorites just because this is a great example of a problem where the math is not that hard, but I think the logic is where people get tripped up. What do you think on this one? Uh, zero to ten. Zero is um, I, I don't know what I was doing. Ten is I'm sure I got it right. How do you feel about this problem? Look how polarized we are on this one. People are either like, yeah, absolutely, or there we go. Okay, there's a couple people in the middle ground there. Man, we really had some zeros and, and tens there to kick things off. I'm going to show you how easy this problem can be. If, if, we get a little scrappy with our strategies and trying, instead of trying to solve it the way the test makers want us to solve it. So what I'm going to suggest to you guys is a strategy called pick for pick. Have any of you taken the full course? Have any of you guys done a, a Manhattan prep full, you know, eight session class? Nobody. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool, cool. So, and this is going to be new to you guys. Uh, usually I have a few of my students in here. I just don't have a class going currently. 
VIC is an acronym that stands for Variables in Choices. And it's the thing that all three of those problems that we just looked at had in common. If you take a look back at every single one of them, every single one of them, instead of having actual numbers down here, had variables. And that tells me something very, very important. That tells me, oh, this one has a couple numbers and a couple of variables. That tells me that whatever numbers I pick, whatever numbers I plug in, this still has to stay true. Which means I don't have to necessarily go through and do this thing algebraically the way the test makers want me to do it. Instead, what I can do is actually pick some numbers. It will be so much easier if we are working through these problems with some values instead of having to do all the algebra. Once you've done that, you're going to calculate a target. So you essentially say, hey, if x and y equal 1 and 2 or equal 2 and 3, then my correct answer should give me a certain value. This is probably the most confusing step. I'm going to show you how that works in a second here. And then the final step is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually test my answer choices. Oops, people had some lag and, and got disconnected. I hope they get reconnected here quickly. All right, let's talk about that first problem. Now, a lot of you guys got this one right. Tell me, if you did, what was the trick to solving this thing algebraically? There's one rule in particular that you need to know in order to solve this thing efficiently and effectively. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yep. It's one of our special product rules. If anybody doesn't know them yet, I highly recommend memorizing the three special products. In this case, we're using this one. It tells me that the whole upper part of this problem is equal to x plus y, the quantity squared. If you know that, and if you see that right away, you can cancel this out, and you know that your right answer is going to be B. If you got that, if you managed to do that, congratulations, pat yourself on the back. That's an excellent trick. Good job really knowing your math. Good job really knowing your formulas. Strong work. If you didn't, like I said, I really recommend you memorize this. Anytime something's special on the GRE, special products, special triangles, it means memorize these because they're going to ask you about it. So if you haven't done so yet, add this to your study list. If you didn't get that, or if you did, let's pretend that it's test day. And in the thick of things, with all that pressure of the time, you're hurrying, you're rushing, and just you draw a blank, and you can't remember that rule on test day. There's another way to solve this problem, and it's that pick for Vic method. Really quickly, guys, uh, give me a value that might be a good one to plug in for X. Five's not bad. I like five. I like two even more. I want to keep this thing as simple as possible, so I'm going to go with some small numbers here just to keep it low. Ah, one. I love one. And Chloe, zero is a very clever number to try out here. I really, really like zero. Um, why is zero such a good number to test here? X won't be equal to Y. X certainly won't be equal to negative Y, which is the rule that we're given. What happens to these terms if X is equal to zero? Yeah, they're going to drop out. Basically, they're going to be zeros also. Very good. 
And then, Cassandra, I'm going to use your suggestion for y. I'm going to say that y is equal to 1. Okay, so I've picked some values. I could pick anything. I could absolutely pick 5 or 37 or 23. I'm going to pick, though, strategically to make sure that when I do this math, the math is going to be as easy as possible. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to really quickly just check my answer choices. And I can see right now that if I use X and Y, it looks like all my answers are still going to be something different. I'm not going to end up with the same answer over and over and over again. I'll show you how that works in a second. Here. Okay, so let's calculate a target then. If X is equal to zero, I'm going to end up with zero plus zero plus one up top. And on the bottom, I'm going to end up with two times zero plus one quantity squared. Somebody solve that for me. What's that equal to? One half. Now we're not quite done. I know this one worked out great, but still, we've got to just make sure. Even though we've got a match here with answer B, I want to test all of my answer choices just in case. So I'm going to go ahead and say, boom. Nope, that doesn't matter. I don't even have any variables to plug in there. I don't have any variables to plug in. If I plug in X and Y that I picked, what is C going to be equal to? Yeah, absolutely. It's just one over one. That's no good. What about D? Good. And that last one, E. Yep. Absolutely. You guys got it. So again, you can do that algebra. In fact, many of you did very successfully and very efficiently do that algebra. But if you didn't know that special product rule, or if you forgot it on test day, look how easy this problem becomes if you pick some numbers. What do you guys think? Are you sold yet? Is what I really want to know. <laughs> I think that smiley face says it all right there. Good. Good. Let's take a look at another problem where we could try this out. How, do you guys feel comfortable enough that I could turn you loose on one and you could give it a shot on your own? I want you guys to try this with the next problem. Uh, let me know, though. You, uh, give me a quick plus one if you feel like, yeah, I got a good idea of how the strategy works. I want to try it out. Minus one if you're like, actually, I'd like to see you do one more, and then I'll try one out on my own. Okay, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. Let's try one more together then. Take a look at this guy. What might be a smart number to pick for X? Okay, I saw a lot of zeros. Let's go with that to start with. Let's say that we go with x equals zero. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to calculate a target. If x is equal to zero, I've got negative two squared, that's four. I've got negative one squared, that's one. I've got zero squared, that's zero. One squared is one, and four, uh, uh, excuse me, two squared is four. And so my total here is going to be 10. You guys with me on that one? Quick plus one if you're on board with how I solved that. Minus one if not. Give me that minus one if you've got some questions about how we got that target. 
All right, then. I'm going to turn you guys loose. I want you guys to test some answer choices now and tell me what happens. So all you're doing, you calculate in target. Now what you're doing is you're going to take the number we picked and you're going to plug it in to see which one gives us our target. Anybody running into some trouble yet? Uh huh. That's the downside of this strategy. If you're not careful about the numbers you pick, or sometimes if you just get unlucky, you may have more than one answer choice that checks out. What do you think you have to do if that happens? Absolutely. Now, I want to give you guys one word of advice here. You could have known ahead of time that zero was not going to work out well. The way you could know is just by taking a look over here and going, oh, look, that one's going to be 10, that one's going to be 10. So I probably wouldn't have picked zero to start with. Uh, but if you did, no problem, because it's quick, right? It's not like we spent a lot of time testing it out. So let's go ahead and try a new one. Let's try it with probably our next easiest answer. Let's try it with one. I'm going to give you guys a chance to do this. Use x equals 1, calculate a target, and then test it out. When you think you've got the answer, when you think you found the one that works, go ahead and pull it in. Only seen a couple answers pulled in so far. I'm going to set the chat back to public. I had it private there for a minute. Tell me, give me a plus one if you manage to successfully calculate a target. If you manage to successfully calculate a target, give me a plus one. Cool. Yeah, oh, Max, sure, I'll show you because we're going to talk about how we calculated that target right now. You take the number that you picked and you plug it in. And that's all you do. Yeah. So we're going to take that x equals 1 and we're going to plug it in here. I'm going to say 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. This is just 1. All of these are squared. And I add these together. I've got 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9. That's going to give me 15. Everybody get that target? Quick plus one if you did. Awesome. All right, so now we take that x equals one, and we plug it back in to see which of our answer choices matches number 15. Okay, so quick vote, guys, yes or no? Give me a y or an n. Does a match? Absolutely not. B? You betcha. C? Very good. D? No, that's going to be too big. And E? No, nope. too small. Is it 9, 21, 11, 5, or something from 15? So there you go. Even if you knew the math, even if you knew how to FOIL, how much simpler does it make this problem if you just pick a number? I mean, I guarantee those of you who are comfortable with your algebra, you could solve this thing if you took a couple minutes solving it. No problem. But for me, if I'm there on test day, 
I'm trying to solve this thing as efficiently as possible. So that number one, I'm not wasting time on it. And number two, so I'm not wasting any brain power on it. Uh, number three, I guess, is also so that I'm not opening myself up to the chance of making silly arithmetic mistakes. You guys with me on this one? Give me a quick plus one if you're on board for uh, what we did here and how we picked this. Awesome. Yes. All right. Cool. I'd love to see that. Anybody with questions still about this? I haven't really had a lot of questions yet. Hit me with them if you got them. Kelsey, I see you typing there. I see a couple people typing there. And I just wanted to say, if you'd like, feel free to grab the microphone. It's uh, the button above everybody's name that just says talk. There it is right there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, the if it made something cancel out so that it was going to be really simple to pick a negative number, that would be one instance where I'd say absolutely do that. Or if the problem tells you that you need to pick a negative number, if it says something like x is less than zero, then of course you've got to pick a negative. That's a really good point. Oh yeah, 100%. In fact, we saw that with this first one here where we picked x and y. Now sometimes you got to be careful. In this particular case, we were able to pick whatever we wanted for x and whatever we wanted for y. Uh, Max and Kelsey, that question is very, very germane to this problem right here. In this one, I can't just pick a value for m and then pick a value for g. I can't do that. Instead, these two things have to have some relationship to each other. So take a second to think about that. I don't even want you to bother with the rest of the problem yet. I want you to just see if you can get me some values for M and for G that will work here. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds on the clock. When you think you have something, I want you to go ahead and send it over to me in the private chat. Now, I'm getting some formulas from folks. I'm not looking for a formula here. I'm looking for values. You can't actually solve this, but just pick a number. Think about what you're going to have to do to this number. Let me suggest, ah, okay, here we go. I like the idea of picking for Gunther first. The reason is we don't have as many restrictions on Gunther here. Somebody gave me 15 for Gunther. Somebody gave me 30. Both of those are really good guesses. I like both of those because with both of them, I can subtract 10 to figure out how old Mason is. So I'm going to go ahead and set that chat back to public. Come on back to the main room. Let's see what happens if we make Gunther 15. If Gunther is 15, how old is Mason? Question marks if you're not sure how we got there. Don't be shy. Let me know if you're not clear. So 
So, uh, Natalie, why don't you grab the microphone? Talk me through how you solved that. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so um, I just think about values that are easy to multiply by two. So um, I actually kind of did it backwards. I picked the value for Mason, which was 10. And so half of that was 5. And then that makes Gunther 15 now. Yeah, that'll work it. That'll work it. I meant to say that'll work. That'll work for it, I suppose, is what I was going for there. Yeah, so if Mason is 10, we know that he is now twice as old as Gunther was 10 years ago. So we take and we divide that in half, and that's how old Gunther was 10 years ago, which means that Gunther is now 15. And Catherine, those two things are related. You could absolutely have picked a guess for how old Gunther was 15 or 10 years ago. That would work. You could say that G minus 10 is equal to 5. That would mean G is equal to 15. And that would be Mason is equal to 10. That works too. Does that make sense, Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a factor of 10, though. I like the way you're thinking strategically there. Um, we could have, for example, said that Gunther was equal to, ooh, 27. So Gunther minus 10 would have been 17, and that would be Mason is twice 17 or 34. It would still work, but it certainly wouldn't be pretty. It certainly wouldn't be pretty. I definitely like 15 and 10 a whole lot more. Okay. I like that. Let's see if you guys can calculate a target for me. I'm going to go ahead and set that chat to private again, and I'm going to give you a minute on the clock. If you think you've got that target calculated, go ahead and send it over to me in the private chat. All right, let's talk targets here. Because the math really isn't that hard once we've got our ages all picked out. We use that first part of the problem to solve for Mason and Gunther's age now, to guess an age for Gunther and then predict an age for Mason. Now what do we need to do? I'm going to set that chat back to public. What do we need to do to calculate our target? Good. By the way, really quickly, somebody was asking me about why Mason's equal to 10 here. Remember, do Mason is now twice as old as Gunther was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Gunther was 5, and so Mason is twice that. So Mason is twice as old as Gunther was 10 years ago. We just have to take Gunther minus 10 and multiply that by 2. 
give me a quick plus one if you guys are with me on that part. Let me make sure that everybody's with me on how we got these ranges here. All right, cool. Then yes, we're asked to find the sum of Mason and Gunther's ages four years from now. How old will Gunther be four years from now? Ah, oh, careful, Gunther's 19. How old will Mason be four years from now? There we go. How old is, what's the sum of their ages then? How hard was that math? On a scale of zero to 10, how hard was that math? Yeah, right? I honestly felt a little silly asking you guys to tell me in the chat because it was that easy. Um, now, there was some translation to be done there. No doubt about that. But still, I feel that having, uh, as my students often tell me too, that having some real numbers to plug into the problem here is way easier than trying to do this thing algebraically. All right, so now we go through and we test. Go ahead and take Gunther's age, plug it in, and see which answer choice gives us our target. When you think you have it, go ahead and pull that answer in for me. All right, awesome, I love it. I'm seeing a lot of right answers coming in here. Fantastic, strong work, guys. If we, um, uh, come on back to that main room if you haven't done so yet. Uh, the nice thing about some of these is that some of these are gonna give me weird enough answers that I know for sure they can't be right. What two answers can I eliminate uh, right off the bat just by looking at them because clearly they're going to give me something weird here. A is going to give me a fraction. I'm going to have 45 divided by 2 plus 3. It's going to have a 0.5 in there. That can't be right. E as well. Boom. Not only is that one out of here, it's negative. No way the sum of their ages will be negative in four years. It doesn't make any sense. Throw that one out. Good. B, some people are saying that B can be eliminated. Why? Way too big. Clearly. I know I got one more too. One last one to toss. Why? Yup, it's going to be negative. We can get that one right out of here and we're left with only one answer choice. We didn't even necessarily do all the math there. Just by looking at these, there were a bunch we could throw out, four that we could throw out, and it left us with only one answer choice. Strong work, guys. Now, Somebody was asking me in the chat, hey, I feel like I do better with these by setting up equations. Is there any reason that I shouldn't be doing that? Uh, absolutely, there is no reason that you should not be setting up equations if that's the way you feel comfortable doing these problems. However, I would 100% recommend that you practice both ways. Practice both ways. Some people like to use this method as their primary strategy, and if so, awesome. Do it. If it works for you, that's great. If you like to use the equations more, hey, absolutely. Awesome. If it works for you, that's great. The reason it's so good to have both in your pocket, though, is for those times when you hit a problem that's more difficult than what you were expecting. Sometimes you're going to try it with the equations and it's just not going to work. Best thing to do then is guess, and if you have time, come on back and try the strategy. It's also going to be great for making some very difficult problems easy. This one is not hard math, for example. This is one of my favorite examples of, of why this strategy is great. This is not hard math by any means, but it's one where it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to be so easy to get confused. So I definitely recommend uh, for a problem like this, using that pick for Vic strategy instead of trying to solve this thing algebraically. It's not that you can't do it. It's just it's going to take more time 
and give you more opportunities to make a silly mistake. Cool. And so that's our pick for VIX strategy, guys. One more time just to review. The steps are pick a number or sometimes numbers, calculate a target by plugging that thing into the problem, and then test those answer choices to see which one works. Strong work. Okay, guys, well, thank you all for joining me here tonight. I'm going to start wrapping up here now. If you're not familiar, of course, Manhattan Prep is not just these free hour-long sessions. We do uh, full courses that are eight sessions long where we dive, dive into this strategy in some more detail and a whole lot of others as well. We'll talk about things like back solving and cheating off of B uh, in quant. In the verbal, we'll talk about using the clues they give you and some of the strategies for uh, solving those reading comprehension problems. Hey, fantastic, guys. I'm glad you all found that helpful. Personally, I always have classes starting. Again, my name is Ryan Hobson. If you're interested in signing up for one of my online classes, please check me out on the Manhattan Prep website. Uh, I hope to get to work with some of you guys in class. Thanks, everybody, and best of luck. Take care.